Wow, it's been a while, and a whole lot of things have happened ever since uh, we last had our podcast where we talked about the U certificate and PG-13. Well, here we are again, Mark as usual, Skinny E Media, and then Bobatron or Rob Bavister. Hello there, Hello. Right? <laughs> I All knew right. you were going to do that. <laughs> Oh, you say hey, hey, and everything, but uh, yeah, uh, I'm glad to be back. Uh, I have missed you dearly, Marcus. <laughs> well, you could say that for you know your significant other, your family. I'm just your mate, your friend. <laughs> but yeah, um, I'm just happy to be on board. We're going to be uh, talking about a few things right here. Mostly, it's going to be about sci-fi and fantasy and dystopian films. Well, yeah, it is good. Uh, you did break up a bit there, Mark, but I think you, you saw, I heard you say Men in Black. I couldn't quite hear the other one you said. Um, it was Jurassic Park. Oh, of course, yeah. And of course, there's um, Independence Day, Terminator 2 and everything. So, yeah. Well, also, there's yeah. a thing. Was was PG-13 the last one we did? or It was the use certificate. I had to edit that one quite a lot. Um, right, because, I'm not saying you know, just swearing and stuff, but we're not going to well, do that here. That's not a problem, Mark. I just wanted to add because you asked me in a PG-13 one, what are the mildest PG-13 films I could think of, and of course I mentioned Golden Compass or maybe Simpsons movie. Of course, in the interim, three other films have come to mind. Uh, there's that 2020 Bill and Ted Face of Music film, uh, and of course, on 2006, there's Devil Wears Prada. And of the year before, the 2005 Fantastic Four film, all three of which are rated PG in both Britain and Australia and maybe Canada as well. So, yeah, those are quite mild PG-13 films. I suppose Devil Wear Prada says shit quite a fair bit. But, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I just thought I'd throw that in there just uh, as a little bit of an addition. But uh, it's kind of not relevant to our current uh, to our current one, but I felt like saying it. Well, I mean, I get your point there. I mean, I will say... Out of all the ones you just mentioned, they don't have the sort of mildness factor that the Terminal had, which was Steven Spielberg's movie that was set in an airport. You could say that Ragdoll movie 9, that's a 12A, but it could have been a PG. It would have been a PG had it came out like in the early 2000s and the 90s. And um, yeah, three twelve. Boy in the yes. Heron, so, as far as I'm concerned, it wasn't quite warranted on Terminal 9 and Boy in the Heron. But that's just my opinion. People may differ Heron. on that. Boy in the Heron isn't as strong as Princess Mononoke. Oh, no. <laughs> no. I was, like, wondering and thinking, well, had it been a 12, when it came out when I was, let's say, like, 8 or 9, I would have been off. Like, I see because it was animated and it had like a 12 or 15 rating. It still made me a bit curious about. I was a bit off on this one. Uh, well, very possibly. I mean, again, you, uh, again, I think you broke up a bit there, Mark. So I didn't quite catch that. But nonetheless, um, this isn't the topic of today. So do you want to get started with today's topic? Well, just for starters, as always, what was your experience with this particular genre? Well, two or three genres altogether. Because Jurassic I mean, Park, I'll let you talk about your favourite film of all time. Right. I mean, science fiction in itself is quite a broad enough tent, and fantasy itself is itself quite very broad as well. To add both of them in there is covering a lot of bases. I mean, it's pretty fair to say that most Saturday morning cartoons we would have watched growing up, let's face it, most of those Saturday morning cartoons either would fall into those ones because it's the easiest way to have some exciting fight, combat violence scenes without actually them seeming too violent. Uh, obviously, I mean, a lot of the cartoons from the 80s and 90s would be things like Thundercats, He-Man, Transformers, which all fall under fantasy or science fiction, and then later, of course, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, or fucking Hero Turtles, as it was over here, because, God, this country's a joke. Um, you know, a lot of that stuff was, um, wow, well, was an integral 
childhood. I mean, most of the stuff, as I mentioned, and of course, later after that, I was watching um, Power Rangers, which, of course, is both sci-fi and fantasy rolled into one, because it's the easiest way to market ex- makes exciting things that are suitable for kids, because you can't have a bunch of, like, uh, you know, commandos or police officers and crooks are blowing the shit out of each other with bullet guns because it doesn't rub them the uh, moral guardians the right way. So, so I mean, to say where I started with it is quite, uh, well, well, you have to go back quite some time. It's quite hard to pinpoint. What about you, Mark? Well, you could say Toy Story, but you know, I'm trying to avoid using animated films that have the, just the, just because they're anime, they can show people who don't talk, talk. You know, just to stay on the safe side, because I could go on about the animated films, but we'll just start with Men in Black, because, you know, when people think sci-fi, that is a title that qualifies under that that genre. Now, I did aliens, get of course bit, it does. Well, got into a bit of trouble for watching it when I was a kid, because it had quite a lot of swearing in it. Um, mm-hmm. I thought, and some of it may have been a bit intense, we saw it at your flat, and that movie still yeah. holds up. Years later, I was not um, that my memory of that particular movie, and I always liked watching it, although it didn't make me learn to love the word shit, which um, in PG films you could say a hell of a lot more than you can now. Hardly you even hear the word shit unless it's like a movie for pensioners at PG or documentary. It does tend to be, um, it has has dropped a lot in PG films quite a lot over the years, and judging by the new guidelines, it uh, probably won't, will drop even more. Although they did say the, it will be sexual swear word, or gendered swear words are going to drop at uh, PG uh, films more, which shit isn't one, so well, I don't know. Um, but yeah, it was quite, I mean, it is quite surprising, because you hear it was cut for a PG rather than a 12, but a cut. Much like Memoirs of Invisible Man, the cuts are so minimal, it's you barely even notice them. Uh, I mean, let's face it, Memoirs of Invisible Man. H- have you even seen that film, by the way, Mark? You haven't said if you have or not. I haven't. It's uh, not a film I can easily find on like uh, libraries or YouTube or charity shops. But I know it's, it's not I... the first film you saw in the cinema and you were a bit perplexed by no, your father first, taking uh, you to go see it. No, no. no. First original film. The first film I remember seeing was Fantasia, which was probably for a 50th anniversary re release or just a re- replaying of it. It was the first original film I remember seeing and first PG rated film I, I remember seeing. Um, no, but that is quite a. I remember I caught it again on TV a few years later when I was watching it, and it's still the cut version because the F bomb isn't in, in, in it. But um, I was surprised, like, Dad, really take me to see this? My God, the word shit is thrown around like a it's a punctuation mark. And even the uh, even the use of the word dickwad, uh, the, you, the bit where Sam Neill, who I've found out is quite a bit in my childhood, I've now realised, is um, a threat to cut someone's testicles off and actually uses the word te- testicle. It's like, wow. You wouldn't get away. You, you wouldn't get away with that in a, in a PG nowadays, and I don't think post twelve A you'd ever get to see that in a, in a in a PG and everything. I mean, I was surprised. I mentioned Devil Mayor's Prada earlier. I'm surprised. I, mean, I know it's not sci-fi, but how many times say shit? And so I surprised they allowed that back in 06. But yeah, but no, um, yeah. But I suppose that the first, it could be the first sci-fi film I saw at the cinema. Actually, now I think about it, because it is sci-fi. It's about the electronic turns a man um, invisible. I don't think I saw any other. Of course, I saw sci-fi films uh, before on TV or video before that, as you I've mentioned before, if you know what I mean. Oh, I do. I will add on a thought there, because I knew you said sci-fi and fantasy animation. At a stretch, can I say Dexter's Lab? Ego Trip. I know it's a TV movie, but they did release it on VHS, and I remember seeing it a lot when I was a child growing up in Essex and uh, Hertfordshire. It's a U certificate, but it's very violent for a U. I mean, we're talking about a scene where, um, like, 
a 20-something age Dexter is tortured with a red laser whip and he's screaming for dear life. That scene didn't scare me or disturb me, but I thought, oh, that, that was quite nasty. I'll, I'll try to render it for you. Hey, now make a wish. This is Man Dark saying this. He's like, oh, ah! number 12, again. Ah! I never number really 12, uh, watched again! Dexter. I never watched Dexter's Laboratory much uh, as a uh, as a kid, so I haven't actually watched the actual uh, movie. But obviously, it does count because it's obviously got sci-fi elements. Although sci-fi elements are almost unavoidable. I mean, with kind of the technology you might see in Bond films, they could class as sci-fi, but I, I don't think they are, to be honest. I mean, well, in many ways, Dexter's Lab is sci-fi because it's about a boy genius scientist who creates all these robots and weird little gadgets and that's and it's also to be said, like Toy Story, my favorite TV show ever. I, I can't even watch some of the episodes. I start crying. <laughs> but yes, um, it all sort of comes back one way or another. And Ego Trip, the TV movie, deals with time travel a lot, so yeah, it qualifies. But okay, sorry, you're well, saying. Got, well, if it's got time travel, then obviously it qualifies. And of course, I mentioned the old Bill, that Bill and Ted uh, movie a few minutes back. So, and of course, that's that counts. Mind you, I didn't watch the Bill and Ted movies or Back to the Future much as a um, as a little kid. I don't know why I didn't. I always thought watched them. I saw my brother watching them. I'm thinking, no, that doesn't look like it appeals to me. And of course, I watched them a few years later on when I'm a bit older. I thought, oh man, I missed out. These are awesome. It is my. I could have gone to see Bill and Ted uh, Most Bogus Journey in 1991 when I was six because it's PG rated. I wish they would have taken me because I would have loved that. It's a great film. I mean, it's, well, it's not great, but it's, it's it's really good fun. No, it is. You was all like stoners acting like Beavis and Butthead before it was Beavis and Butthead because it's excellent. Well, <laughs> a typical Californian surfer dudes and everything, slacker dudes. They're you know, typical Gen X and everything, even though Mark Connery is technically a boomer. But I mean, yeah, it's like, Excellent. Um, <laughs> I will uh, say, my... not to interrupt you. Um, no, that's all right. The, the, they are PG rated films, but the films that I always associate with teenagers and adolescents. So even if it was, let's say, like a 12 or a 15, it probably wouldn't have made much of a difference box office wise because those are the movies that I would assume, like people who are in the, like that. 13 to 21 bracket would really go see and then bogus journey from what i remember also had some quite intense and scary scenes i i Anthropophobic. thought it was funny oh yeah he does say references the, the other f word in there oh, no. which, which to be fair over on this side just means oh. cigarettes over here it just means cigarettes so i mean <laughs> but well that is less. true but it's like you know saying the c word in america they mean it with venom in Britain, it's gender neutral, but uh, yeah, but you wouldn't I'm say sure. that. Yeah, but you wouldn't give that say that in a PG rated film, though, would you? Oh, oh, absolutely not. You can say. Hell, back rant. then it was an automatic eighteen. Oh, absolutely. Well, with nail and I, that got away with it often to a gentleman, but yeah, say that automatic eighteen. And, um, <laughs> Glenn Carey and Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Oh. Oh, yeah, that uh, legal drama. I almost forgot about that one. I know we're getting off a bit of a tangent there, but, yeah. Um, Furman was are... a twat. So... But, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I was, that was always a bit of a weird one. Mentioned... Bogus journey, because, yeah, that sort of we're in hell sort of atmosphere about it. And I thought, mm, there's going to be some parents who might be concerned that might be a bit too intense for small children, but... What six-year-old is watching Bill and Ted or Wayne's World? Well, exactly. And to be fair, I mean, it's so goofily done that I think you, it's... Oh, I, I wish my parents had paid me to see it. Or I think I've seen it back in 91 because it would be cool. I mean, Bill and Ted are awesome. But um, as we're talking with sci-fi films, should we inevitably bring up Robocop? Well, it is a part of your traumatic childhood. Um, I know that particular scene um, scarred you until you got older. But go on, just say I it. Couldn't, I just couldn't watch the damn film again for like several years because um, Murphy's death scene really did a number on me. I mean, it's just, it's just so sadistic. I mean, 
I was speaking it to my brother when I saw him recently. He's the one who showed me it. And um, he was saying, show you that when you were five, did you? I'm like, oh, bloody hope I didn't. I was like, because he would have been 12 or maybe if it was 16, 13. And we we were like perturbed by that bloody scene. It was like, yeah, I mean, no fucking shit. That scene, Murphy's death scene. I mean, you watch it now and I suppose it's kind of goofy. Well, yeah, All right, you watch it in like a 21st century adult eyes. But for like, some the late 80s, early 90s, everything, especially when you see it not as an adult, it is fucking scary, man. I mean, it's the way just Kurtwood Smith plays his plays Clarence Bonnaker and just delivers the lines. It's just, and all the other guys just join it, just play their, uh, play their roles too, and then say their lines. It's just, oh, it is, yeah. Well, you. Well, uh, I'm gonna, I'm you know. gonna really piss you off. I'm, I'm going to up, really upset you. I'm going to do the voices and the noises from that scene in case if the trauma kicks up and you want to run out the room. Dude, I've seen it so many times now. No, I've no, become... no, 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 no. <laughs> Look at the man in the hand. All right, fans over. Yeah, it's gruesome. Um, I'm sure even... With all the violence in 15 films nowadays, it probably still would be past 18, just based on well, the, the direct- sadistic factor. Well, the director's cut, it certainly would be. I mean, the director's cut is still an 18. It's probably one of the few films back then that still warrants it. Because, I mean, let's say it, that's a thing that couldn't get through an R in America. It had to be rated X or NC-17. And I will stand up and say, yes, it deserves it. It's what that rating is made for. So you wear it. Um, so yeah, it does warrant it's 18 now. I mean, I can watch, you can pass John Wick with 15, you can pass Logan and Deadpool with 15, and Joker with 15, and I totally say good on you, the, because it shows that the BBFC are cooler and more based than they were, which is not so just, well, I've been through with them, but they're not complete pearl-clutching prigs anymore, although they've still got some ways Every to go. Every now and they slip up. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they do. Well, I mean, we, we've talked about hot, their hang-ups of horror, which we need to get over. But again, let's not get too bogged into it. But Robocop, especially with director's cut, is fucking hard. And um, yeah, that that does warrant being kept solely at 18 or anything. Obviously, all the other 18 films from back then did have been recategorized 15, and that's where they belong, granted. Because we can bring up... We're talking about uh, sci-fi, so of course... Again, just as inevitably, we have to mention the Alien and Terminator films. Yes, we do, I'm afraid. Now, those are movies that I'm probably fine at being downgraded to the 15 level. Um, Most kids and teenagers have seen those films by now and probably weren't scarred by it, although I'm sure Alien probably gave um, some young boys and young girls a... uh, made them piss in their pants in fear. Terminator, a lot less so, unless you're talking about the um, robot exo- endoskeleton inside, and it looks, you know, sort of menacing. Be like, mm, for me, it's the T-3000. But I know you saw those films when you were a nip. I didn't see them growing up. So I'll let you speak on this a lot more. Okay, well, first things first, before I go any further on, me and Tom and some of his friends, we talk about um, the potentiality of the BBFC splitting the the 15 rating into a 14A and a 16 rating. And with that in mind, we actually reckon Terminator and Alien would actually fit quite comfortably into a 14A rating. Hell, Terminator 2 probably would as well, because you realize actually how tame they actually are. And I mean, Alien is, an, they're all amazing films. Alien is is brilliant. Uh, I think Aliens may be better, but that's, your mileage may vary depending on what you want out of a film. Uh, Alien is freaking tame, though. And there's only four or five uses of the word fuck, depending on which version you you watch. And let's face it, the first version that was released would have, was a theatrical, which only had four uh, uses of it. Uh, there's no sex, nudity, or drug usage or any of that stuff. The only strong bit of violence is the chestburster scene, and that's barely stronger than anything that was you saw in Jaws four years earlier. In fact, it was ever rated X or 18, it was fucking ridiculous, and it would have fit perfectly into a, the dub boundaries of a double A even back in 79. I mean, the, the, the 
fucking BBFC have said it was only just because they thought the creature was too sexually perverse, they had to rate it X. Uh, although considering how the a lot of the special effects were made in Alien, it, it does is quite eye opening. Have you heard of, like what they used to actually make some of the special effects in Alien? No, not for like the xenomorphs and stuff. Well, well don't tell me they used like some sort of S and M level. No, that's not what Jism. they used. The the slime was used using hay white jelly. I trust you know what that is. Oh, I know. And not that I put it on bits, myself. <laughs> certain bits of the alien were made using shredded condom. Well, With talk about mind, kinky there for a second. I know H.R. Geiger, who made the designs of the xenomorphs, he was a bit of a freak elite. <laughs> again, I can't help thinking that's why the, the BBS just looked at it and said, ew, it has to be an 18. It's like, you dicks. Well, but no, I mean... The, let me just stop you for a second. By that logic, then they would have had to raise Edward Scissorhands' rating to, like, the the 12 he was going to get, or even 15, because Edward Scissorhands, which is a fantasy film, by the way, he's just like some sort of S&M fetish character. He's just missing the ball in his mouth. Yeah, but, dude, Mark, you just used the word logic. That didn't apply to Furman BBFC. I'm very aware of that. I'm just laughing. It makes for good banter. But sorry to interrupt it you. It does. No, it's okay, man. It's okay. I mean, that's what we're here to, we're here to talk. Um, yeah, so Alien is a great film. And, um, you know, it's yeah, it's barely stronger than 12A, but obviously the chest burster doesn't really prevent it from being that. But if it, if there was a 14A and a 16 rating, 14A would be fine. Uh, you could say the same about Terminator. The word fuck is mentioned a few more times in that. Uh, according to IMDb, it's eight times, although feel free to double check that if you want to quote me on it. Um, there's there's one sex scene, but it's quite tastefully done. You don't really see much. Uh, in terms of gore, well, there's the heart scene and ripping scene and the uh, scene with the eye, with the eyeball in, the, in that uh, motel room. But again minimal you don't see him you don't just see your heart being ripped out you just see him holding it and it's just like it's clearly a, a fake prosthetic over an android again if it was a, if there was a 14a and a 16 rating i'd put it 14a same goes for terminator 2 so tame and the action and the, and the high octane action uh tone of terminator 2 makes it even tamer if you ask me but fucking god is terminator 2 an awesome flick i watched it not too long ago and uh, I just said, my God, they don't make movies like that anymore. I mean, and they just don't. I mean, the only film I can think of within the past 20 odd years that's reached that sort of level of awesomeness or that scope or scale of awesomeness is probably The Dark Knight. Well, I'll you take see? your word for it because I know you're a big fan of two of those films. He, he shared a list with me on private messaging showing his top 10 favorites. And T2, Judgment Day, and Dark Knight certainly appear on there, I'll say. But I, I kind of get what you mean, because it's as the visual effects aliens. for its time were very strong. Yeah, as does Aliens. Well, a lot of people like that one particularly. Did um, That was James Cameron who did Aliens, not Ridley Scott. Uh, yeah, yeah. James Cameron did Aliens, just like James Cameron did both the first two Terminator films. So, yes. A Aliens is technically stronger than Alien. In fact, there's much more swearing. The word fuck is mentioned a lot more. There's no nudity or sex or anything in it. Uh, or any of that crap. Uh, no drug abuse. Uh, gore. There's probably a bit where you do see another chestburster scene, but in that chestburster scene, it's actually tamer because it's really dark and you don't really see anything. And all the deaths are mostly off screen with minimal, minimal impact. I mean, maybe it would be in a. 14A rating, I don't know. I mean, again, this is just me spitballing because well, I'm going to a complete hypothetical that they would just split 15 into a 14A and 16. But I mean, have you ever thought about that potential scenario of a 15 being split into a 14A and a 16? Have I mentioned um, it to you before? Not in this instance. I thought, you know, because the BBFC guidelines were published uh, since we last had our podcast. I was assuming they would do like a pilot scheme, like they did in Norwich with the PG-12, which ultimately became 12A. But no such thing. It's still 
really much pending and I don't think there's going to be a 15A or 14A anytime soon or, or 15 is going to be bumped up to 16. Just like double A was 14, but then they bumped it up to 15. Made it, you know, more clear, less vague, but hmm, it, it does make you wonder a little bit. Um, I, I think Terminator 2 and Matrix and Mad Max Fury Road which I saw, you know, that's a 15, but it could have been a 12, eh, in my opinion. It is. <laughs> oh, no. That's R rate, cause, dude, it's R rated as well. I know. I, I thought, oh, it's going to be you know, quite a bit of blood. And swear. They've only got like two scenes, like someone's uh, mask was ripped out of their face and there was some blood. And then someone got shot and there was some blood. But it was very brief. You almost those, couldn't tell. I saw more blood in Beowulf. That's a fantasy film, the, by the way. And that was much not, more graphic. Yeah, and the not just the um the blood and gore, but wearing is minimal as well. I, I can't remember if that word fuck is it it's maybe mentioned once or twice, but it's not exactly a cluster F bomb movie, is it? I didn't really hear any sort of profanities whatsoever. It was almost like when I saw Prometheus. That was kind of on the borderline between 12A and 15. Like, if they just cut out maybe a, a bit of gore or try to twist around the abortion scene, they probably could have got the PG-13 knowing them. I always talk about Prometheus as a line because I think you're in it. You're that albino alien thingy who drinks something and dies in the beginning. It Was that you, Rob? Well... They called me onto the set and everything. They said, "Okay, here's your, here's your costume." I said, "I don't need my costume. I'll just do it, do a plane effect." Okay. And then they 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 said the checks in the mail. It never came through. I need to call up Ridley Scott about that or anything. But um, wait a second. I wasn't in that movie. What the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> no, because I saw you know the photos of it, and you have the same jawline, and you know. The, no hair, just like the alien thingy from the beginning, which is called like I, the protector. I'm aware of that, dude. I'm aware of that, dude. Oh, also, no. um, Bad Max Fury Road. To pop that off, also MA15 Plus in Australia. I know that they said it was for like the post apocalyptic themes combined with the violence, but I, I find it maybe a bit of bullshit, really, because there's probably M films. Which is their PG thirteen or twelve eight that just as having as much violence, if not more, than Fury Road. I know this Furiosa film just coming out soon actually is, seems like it's gonna be stronger for strong violence and grisly images, which sounds Fucking more better, intense mate. than the intense sequences of violence and action that the previous entry got. But you know, I, we're not the MPA, we're not uh, ACB, so we can't dictate these decisions but if i was the parent i would rather have them go see fury road over casino royale or kite runner or uh 10 cloverfield lane or sound of freedom you know, as far as like you know hard pg 30s versus mild r's are concerned i will add yeah. one a little thing as well alien i'm not so much of a fan of it as much as i am of the pornographic parody of Alien that we know as Alien from the Darkness, oh, which we talked about in a podcast that we probably shouldn't talk about again, but that was going to be R18, but they had to cut it out to make it 18 by removing any sort of you know, unsimulated animated sex and tentacle rape. I thought the censorship was fine because I, that movie gave me nightmares. I remember the DVD cover for it, and that scared the shit out of me. But it turned me on for some reason. Don't get me started. Right. Uh, okay. Well, a bit off topic. So, well, it's, it's sci fi, so maybe not. But I just wanted to add in Prometheus was originally MA15 plus in Australia, but re rated to M. So make of that what you will. Mm. Oh, I mean, that's uh, caught, caught me by surprise, I would say. Mm. I must admit, it is tame and everything. I mean, I always am of the, um, like I say, I do expect consistencies across ratings boards. If something's, he, you know, I mean, when I hear something's R rated, I expect 15 and MA 15 plus in Australia. Uh, if it's PG 13, I expect 12A and M. I know there's going to be discrepancies, but there can't be that many discrepancies. You really do have, these films are made for certain ratings. 
there has to be, you know, you have to be willing to like give those rates be reasonable. But well, I mean, that's you, that's just do for consistency's sake. But we live. <laughs> Oh no! I'm almost almost going to say we live in a society, but we live in a world where the 15 and R films are so bloody and graphic these days. It, you know, when you look at the old school 15 and 18 titles, it almost sort of throws you off a bit. Like, oh, that was mild, or no, that wasn't really anything really. Um, only a few stand like RoboCop, which still packs a punch to this day. But you know, you think to yourself, like with Matrix, for example. I can let my 12 or 13 year old watch Matrix because that's what I did. I watched it with my father and I didn't get mentally scarred by it. Da Vinci Code scarred me more so than Matrix. That is true. <laughs> Try to bring um, it in a little bit. Um, I don't know if you want to bring up on dystopian films because I did hint at it with Mad Max. Which well, there is that. Uh, but oh, how do you consider, let's say, it's not really sci-fi, but it, it people think it is. Clockwork Orange. I, we could talk well, about that one for hours. So we'll try I've only to seen it once. Bit. I've only seen it once. So good film. I mean, uh, it was rated X both sides of the Atlantic. Maybe at the time it probably yeah I'd say it. Is it yeah it warranted it. I mean, there's like the rape scene would probably would get stop it from getting dropped down to a 15 nowadays because obviously it's not exactly as strong as an impactful it was it was never actually banned of course it, it's it's a misconception but it was it's just that um stanley kubrick uh withdrew it from um who's a big name in the sci-fi if not if i can remember correctly um uh, because he did a two uh the 2001 a space odyssey but he asked for clockwork orange to be withdrawn from syndication due to the backlash against it and it was only re-released in britain uh, after he um passed away so yeah i mean it's a it's a good film i mean uh it's quite you really think it's just about thugs go around beating people up but it's more about like how supposedly decent people can be turned to violence because when he came back and he was uh sort of cured as i cured artificially everyone just basically started beating the fuck out of him and everything but no, no uh, it's always an interesting one to bring up anyways because i know we've talked about it on a few occasions before but when that film sort of i heard that it came out i saw the previous fit for sky box office in 99 or 2000 i thought what is this dangerous movie you're not supposed to see? Because the only reason why I knew about it was because my father confessed to seeing Clockwork Orange in New York when he was uh, there in the 80s, escaping Thatcher's Britain. Only go to Reagan's America. But they, thought they had the legal opportunity to watch Clockwork Orange in the United States, where it was R rating at the time. And I always thought that was a bit funny. Oh, it's so like with Natural Born got, Killers. He saw it overall. It got re-rated, didn't it? The didn't it? Because it was originally X-rated, but I think they edited it down to an R. Uh, yes, it was some of the, um, like you said, the sexual violence, probably even regular sex stuff that they probably had to nip in the bud a bit. So I actually don't know what the original version actually looks like. So I've only seen, you know, what I assume is the X BBFC or 18 version as it is. I mean, regardless... That is one movie I can think of that should never be downgraded to eighteen to fifteen, like they did with Fight Club. If they downgrade it to fifteen in another thirty years, I will put that world means the world has gone to shit. A movie that controversial could be seen by even more people now. But you know, right? But I mentioned earlier on. But basically, it's probably the rape scene that stops it from being 15. Um, although I mean, don't know how much of it you actually see, so it probably could downgrade to a 15. I mean, obviously, every time a 18 gets downgraded to a 15, I consider that a win because it shows that we're we're liberalising. Britain's becoming much more progressivist, and the BBFC are, are well, I've spoken about this ad infinitum and everything. Um, but um, I don't know where am I going with that. I would, cause I wouldn't exactly give it a for, I wouldn't exactly um, uh, consider it a bad thing if Clockwork Orange gets downgraded to a, a 15. Most Furman 18s probably pass for 15 nowadays. If it 
Exorcist is only still in 18 because of that crucifix masturbation scene. So, I mean... Now, you mentioned dystopias because I wanted to segue into my next point because it's not really sci-fi, this next film we're talking about. It's certainly not fantasy. It's very gritty and realistic, but it is technically dystopia. I've just recently, I, don't, I think you have as well, seen Civil War. Now, that's a movie I could go on for hours like I do with Da Vinci Code or Toy Story, but I'll nip it in the bud a bit. Yes, that is very much uh, dystopian. And Alex Garland himself, he done 28 Days Later, he has done sci-fi in the past, but this is a movie that we both saw, and I thought the movie was going to have problems with censorship because of the politics, and there's probably going to be chances of terrorist activity like there was in Aurora, Colorado, when they showed Dark Knight Rises, but none of that materialized. And I've heard more people complaining about it being kind of vague and a bit, well, it how come it doesn't speak for the left? We sh it should be more anti-capitalist. But in a way, you get sort of best of both worlds. If you're left wing, and you watch that scene with Jesse Plemons saying, what kind of American are you? You're thinking, okay, he's MAGA. Or the scene with the guys with the n nail polish and the dyed hair, they're probably coded as gay or non-binary. And you're thinking as someone on the right, oh, look at them woke uh, libtards. I can't... I Sorry, my memory seems to be failing me. I can't remember those ones. It, it was a brief scene. It was at the Christmas park they were at, and there was some guys who probably were coded as gay or non-binary uh, doing shooting practice. They were saying, we're trying to shoot something. This is a war, you know? No. Oh, oh is well, it was a sniper scene. Yes. Yeah. And they're in a the Christmas I, park or something. I didn't. I didn't pick. I didn't pick up them being gay or non-binary. But then again, that's probably not something I would really pick up. To be honest, I have not got a good gaydar. Um, well, I'll yeah. put it this way: the reason why I was saying it is because it's a very political film. That's not really political on a ratings level. It's a strong fifteen, but I'm actually fine with it being fifteen. Because it, it, it has a sort of 15, war dude. context about it. And, you know, it's, you know, if you see the evening news, you've seen it all. I'm a little bit more flexible with it if it's more sort of like showing it for what it is and it has the sort of journalism context and if it's like a sort of shoot 'em up sort of thing like John Wick or Gorefest, like uh, Deathgasm. But what was your take on it as far as the, po the political controversy? Right. Okay, well, you mentioned uh, earlier about they thought there was going to be a cause for political shooting, but you mentioned the Dark Knight Rises in Colorado. I'm surprised you didn't mention Joker and the fear of it would inspire incel uh, violence. I don't think it would. I, I, probably not likely. Um, but no, I mean, I, but yeah, it is politically very vague. I mean, you don't really get much backstory as to, you don't even know what the ideologies of all the various factions are. You're not even told who you're meant to be rooting for, who are the good guys and who are bad guys. But then again, that is the point. Uh, it is meant to be like that. I mean, when you're in the war zone, and what it's like to have this stuff going around you, that it almost becomes just a background noise. Um, it, it, you stop thinking about the politics of it or the... Um, uh, who the side, you know, the ideologies, and who are who's fighting who, and for what reasons fighting who? All you know is just that, like, there's death and destruction and carnage going around you, and, um, and that's about. And uh, you just become desensitized to it. They even mention it in the sniper the scene. You mentioned the sniper scene, and so they someone asked them about the politics, or the ideologies of it, it, and they just said, "Someone's trying to kill us. We're trying to kill them before they can." Or I don't know if that's exactly what they said. They said words to that effect. And it's like, yeah, that's all it is to these people. It actually reminded me of a lot of film, two films it reminded me of, actually. Um, you may find this a bit weird, but uh, first of all, it's for two, Steven Spielberg's 2005 War of the Worlds film, which we could, should have mentioned earlier, or any World, Worlds films. And uh, the 2010 film Monsters. Uh, I, don't I know if kind of get that. Because no, you're, I've you're, seen... War of the World the with Tom Cruise. Yeah, that's what I meant. Because it's all from a point of view of people on the ground. It doesn't really... 
you don't really see much of people who are in the higher echelons of power sort of plan to like doing all the war plan or or basically waxing on about the situation or sort of thing. It's all backstories given through well either some brief news reports or from the or for some background and everything. And it's yeah, it's meant to immerse you more into it. Which at first I didn't actually like when I first saw War of the Worlds, but in retrospect, I've realised it's about show don't tell. I was like, oh, okay, I get it now. So yeah, well, that's so what I mean, they say about quiet plays, you know, that movie is quite understated. It's sci-fi, but it's also horror as well. Um, my approach with Civil War was a little different. Most people, most of my friends, did not like that movie. I did. It's my number one favorite of the year so far. It's because I watch a lot of news, particularly from DW and France. Van Cat and uh, NBC News, BBC, and all sorts of material, including, yes, Tucker Carlson and InfoWars. It does make me quite paranoid, and I start picking on little tidbits here and there of, oh, this is supposed to be this, this is supposed to be that. You know that scene with the uh, Jesse Plemons guy with the sunshades? He's like saying, what kind of American are you? I bet yeah. you were thinking, oh, that's supposed to be some sort of MAGA white nationalist guy who's probably right wing militia. They don't say it overtly, well, I... but it's obvious he's quite racist because he questions about people's nationality. That that was pretty that was pretty obvious. That was pretty in the that was about as on the nose as it got, really. I mean that it was pretty obvious what they were on about. I mean I don't know if it was meant to but, but yeah, I mean, he did strike you as one of those right-wing militia types who's watched too many Infowars, who believes in too many of these black helicopter conspiracy theories. And, you know, one of those Timothy McVeigh types. Um, so, oh. yeah, I mean, that was... Uh, pardon? No, no, but you're right. I'm sorry I'm laughing a little bit there because I, I remember seeing it with the audience that I did see it with. There wasn't any sort of shit that was stirring up. It was a healthy mix of older and younger people and it was ethnically mixed i don't know what the audience was like for you in cardiff but i'm sure it was mostly kind of young people who are already like corbyn voters who are kind of paranoid about a trump type of government occurring in the uk well to be honest i want a lot of people there actually i went to see them in the imax down odin where we saw blue beetle oh um, yes of course yeah i went to see it don't worry and yeah they finally fixed that bloody light by the way um oh. Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Took him a while because it was still flashing to uh, two months later. I went to see Killers of a Flower Moon, but let's not get off topic. Um, there were there wasn't many people in there. There was a but the people I saw in there were relatively young. I think younger than me. Uh, they definitely looked younger than me. Um, I couldn't vouch for their politics. I didn't talk to any of them or interact with any of them. I think they were just there to watch a film, but this is Cardiff and everything. There aren't a lot of young people in Cardiff that are right wing or anything. Most people in Cardiff, especially young people, tend to swing quite quite hard to the left. If only if only for well, South Wales in general isn't exactly uh isn't exactly friendly to the Tories and they mostly vote day before economic reasons rather than um uh progressivist reasons. But Cardiff's quite a progressivist uh, place, so yeah, they won't well, I'm rambling a bit here, but no, no. Uh, yeah, I don't think many of the people there would have been hardcore Tory or Nigel Farage type UKIPers or anything. You don't get many of those types in Cardiff. Well, at least that's reassuring. Now, I did hardly get any trouble when I was in uh, Cambrai. I love, I love your country, by the way, mainly because they speak a language that in, that English people long time ago used to tell them. How dare you speak it? We'll put a sign that says WN on your shoulder as punishment. So I'm glad that they have the linguistic authority that other parts of the UK, particularly Scotland and Northern Ireland, don't quite have. But that's beside the point. Did you wear a shirt that says, because I wore a shirt uh, <clears throat> that was from Ramones and it had the eagle with the... Uh, I don't think I've seen that one to be honest. So I mean, I can't really, uh, I can't really uh, comment to be honest. So yeah, I've not seen seen that one. But um, did you wear yeah, like a of... fuck Trump shirt? <laughs> no, I don't tend to wear. I don't really wear many political statements on myself. No. I mean, ten years ago, the most 
aggressively thing I wore, or my heavy metal t-shirts. I don't really wear them too much uh, anymore, but I don't really, I don't know very rarely if I ever wear, I don't think I've ever worn a political slogan, to be honest. I mean... Well, you might be I'd doing do. yourself a favour, because I don't want you to get your head kicked in. Well, if you do, you're Jason Statham in uh, Moonlighting as Jason Statham. He kicks a lot of ass. I'd be scared to meet him in the dark, especially if I looked at his wife. However, let me change the subject a little bit, because I know people have been talking about Civil War on news platforms and stuff, but people who are curious about that one or didn't like that movie, they really need to see The Purge. And I brought it up on the Vigilante podcast, and they are dystopian movies about an America where all crime is legal for one night, 12 hours. They are some of the most... uh, (laughs) A violent and quite biting 15 films I've seen at least in my lifetime. I mean, these are movies that essentially play on people's sadistic imagination about, hmm, who should I kill next? Well, yeah, it is a bit, um, yeah, kind of a few plot holes in it because you say like all crime is legal and what for one night, but then they just, but the night goes at end and everyone just goes back to being law abiding citizens. And, and what everyone just goes back to getting along this person just tried to break into your house and kill and rape you or uh, everything probably not in that order but i mean i think the night before and now you're working with them the next day yeah i don't think that really detracts but um i haven't seen any purge films in fact the closest I've ever come to seeing one is watching the uh a review by a, the nostalgia critic um and he said it was well he, he said what he said about it. um i haven't really got much thing to say about it. i don't think any of them done well on the tomato meter uh, well i know you're a bit finicky about um rt scores um i personally am more flexible about it. i really don't care but as as far as i'm concerned to the audience who's listening take my word for it about civil war if you didn't like it or if you did watch purge election year Purge 4, or First Purge, and the Forever Purge, and you'll see kind of where, what Civil War sort of lacked as far as an overt political message or more graphic violence. The Purge films more or less make up for it, as does the movie The Hunt, which got into a bit of trouble because they had to delay the release because of a mass shooting in El Paso. And then the movie had trouble when it actually got released because COVID. So, mass shooting in America? A mass shooting in America? Oh my God, whatever now. Well, it was like a death wish. They had to delay the release because of some scandal. They, and also part of the delay was because the marketing for The Hunt, which is a dystopian film, does make it look like left-wing elites killing and murdering sort of working-class right-wing people from like Montana or Wyoming or Idaho. And it's and all it played as like a most dangerous game sort of thing. It kind of is that, though. I mean, let's face it. I mean, it is sort of like a bunch of liberal elitists are basically hunting a bunch of MAGA types and everything, which gives you a bit of moral ambiguity. But, I mean, at the end, they realise that the main character in it wasn't even the person they thought it was. It wasn't even a, a MAGA type. It was a most apolitical individual. It's like, eh, a bit of a cop-out, but okay. Well, if you take out the politics of it, this sort of dystopian saying, it's actually quite a clever, dark comedy action thriller. It's not a horror movie at all. I don't know what Blumhouse was thinking, but yeah, it, if you, you know, that's why I recommend it for people who like Civil War, but that's beside the point, really. I could have said, well, anyway, you know, Battle Royale or uh, The Running Man, those are dystopian movies, and Battle Royale certainly was controversial for being very violent. Oh, very violent, very... It didn't get a release in the US for a long time. Yeah, it's a good film and everything in the film, but um, uh, it's obviously what Hunger Games was based on and everything, but... Which is another film we could talk about. But one film I... Well, two films I wanted to talk about. Well, kind of three, maybe. Because, obviously, we're talking about dystopia we're talking about uh, sci-fi and of course dystopia we've got 1984 and of course sci-fi we've got the matrix of course it makes me about 2002 film with christian bell equilibrium if you've seen it 
the following activity has been rated EC10. That's the one bit I remember from that movie. And I, my father, he wanted to see, and I was like, okay. I didn't feel like it was like a full fifth. I mean, there was some blood spurts, and I think like a scene where someone is sliced in half. But even that felt a bit cartoonish to me. Maybe I was not seeing the same film as you did, but the film in some respects actually is kind of pertinent to what we have now, like V for Vendetta is, because I think there's a subplot about um, books or sort of media being burned or censored, it, which is what they're the doing sub- in Ron DeSantis in Florida and shit. Mark, that's not a subplot. That is the plot. They basically destroy all forms of art because it might um, cause uh, people to feel emotions, which they're trying to repress. Exactly, and I wish I appreciated that message when I first saw it, but it, maybe I, because of family reason, it just didn't materialise. But 1984, uh, which I read in school and saw that film from 1984 that had John Hurt. He always talks like that. Yeah, I've I, seen that. I, that was one of my favourite films, not only because there's some uh, a beautiful woman um, and there's some sex, but it was quite a disturbing energy about it. And it's also got the Eurythmic soundtrack. Can't go wrong with Annie Lennox. Great music. So, yes, but it's a 15 nonetheless because of the sexual content and torture. Oh, yeah, obviously. I mean, the, the 1984 as a, uh, as a story is just fucking terrifying. I mean, I don't know how close it is to ever getting real. I mean, it was written in 1948. It's what Orwell thought then where the world might go. Oh, because I try not to talk about Big Brother 1984 too much because it tends to be a favourite among the tinfoil hat-wearing conspiracy kooks who think that any form of, like, um, anything they don't like is 1984, even though you're criticising it, so, you know, it isn't. <laughs> well, um, some, of the, some of the decisions that are seem to lean on the, the far left and the far right, both of the far left and far right does not like the Patriot Act. Nor do I. So. Well, yeah, I mean, it's not surprising that during the 2000s, during the height of the Bush administration, the war on terror, um, a lot of people who were big fans of Michael Moore and, and opposing Bush administration, its Patriot Act and everything, somehow became fans of Alex Jones. I admit, uh, this is quite embarrassing for me to admit, but I have to go, I did briefly in the 2000s go through a 9-11 trooper phase and an Alex Jones fan uh, fanboy phase. From about 2006 to for the 2007, I think. I think I, oh yeah, by the time 2008 rolled around, I, I pretty much given it the quiz, uh, got over it. But I mean, I used to listen to a lot of Alex Jones myself too. The globalists are gonna come and get you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, globalist, you know, yeah. It's like dog whistle, eh? Hey, for um, that word that begins with J and rhymes with news. Um, yeah, but uh, as I was saying, yeah, it is quite embarrassing. But of course, you know, he used to talk about uh, 1984 as well. And of course, we saw things like the Patriot Act and um, the constant fear of Osama bin Laden and the need to constantly invade countries. And just, and of course, a lot of people said, "Oh, this is what Orwell warned warned us about." I mean, it probably wasn't. But I mean, yeah, but fucked up, fucked up here anyway. What he did was shit. Um, well, I don't, again, I don't know where I'm going with that, but I mean, I've just had to, had to get well, off my chair. We're just bringing it up in the context of dystopian fiction because there are there is some overlap with sci-fi within this realm, and you know, when people bring up about 1984, many people will bring up what Alan Moore did with his the Vendetta graphic novel, and then the subsequent film that came out in the mid 2000s. I know I wanted to see it when it first came out, but wasn't quite 15 at the time. But the the film, you know, having seen it, you know, it's I'm actually surprised the movie even got financed and cleared for Warner Brothers in DC because that is certainly one of the most subversive films I have ever seen. Essentially, it makes terrorism, albeit left-wing terrorism, look kind of serious. Unfortunately, no, I've read Watchmen, but not Beef and Vendetta. I've, I've, I've read the comic book. It is so much better than the film. It does it, it does go a lot more um, into the nitty-gritties of it, though, and everything, because it's so much more more ambiguous, because the it is overtly fascist, the uh, the the regime has taken over Britain and everything. They're called Norse Fire. They 
it, it was based very much on the politics of the nineteen eighties and the rampant homophobia and everything. And and of course, what's his face? Uh, the terrorist V is an out and out anarchist, which is what um, Alan Moore is for a record, and uh, I'm sympathetic towards. Um, yeah, and his whole thing is I need to. He just wanted to completely blow up the um the the, uh, the system in the in the comic. He actually blows up Parliament at the beginning of at the beginning, not at the end. Uh, something else is blown up at the end. I, I can't quite remember. I think it's like the government bunker, but I can't. Remember. But uh, I need to read it again to be honest. But um, yeah. But it is, in terms of fighting against dystopia, it is a lot. It is a it is on the level of um, 1984 off. Uh, Fahrenheit 451, or was it 451? Yeah, Fahrenheit 451, or Brave New World. We all these books that all these right wing conspiracy conspiracy theorists like to quote, which they blatantly never read. Um, well, especially on Fahrenheit 451. I mean, if they read the book itself, they wouldn't be banning all these books about gender queer or critical race theory, like in Florida and Pennsylvania and a lot of states right now. We could be doing a podcast on banned books, but we I don't also, have quite the experience with books and literature like I do with films. So also, this is why... I'd like to mention, in spite of how many right-wingers like to talk about him, George Orwell was actually a socialist. Yes, he sure was, and fought in the Spanish Civil War um, for the Republican, the Republican cause. Side. Which I we need to probably get back onto the on the topic. Uh, the second Dune film came out this year as well. That's sci-fi with a bit of fantasy. Have you seen it? I've never seen the Dune movies, the David Lynch ones or the Denis Villeneuve. You can refresh me whether you know it's warrants to twelve A or if it's controversial. No, no, it's perfect, perfect twelve twelve A material. Very good flick. Is it controversial? Nah, it's not controversial. I think it's a, it's very good standalone sci-fi film. <laughs> I remember. Let me bring that up because we got to we talk about sci-fi and fantasy. So I've got to mention Lord of the Rings, and of course this the Dune flicks could be a new rings when Tolkien wrote Lord Red. Red Dune, he didn't like it. He felt it a bit too morally grey and morally ambiguous. But it's like, yeah, dude, you fought in the bloody, you fought in World War One, but you're like, um, you've got a very romanticised view of the world, which a lot of high fantasy like uh, Lord of the Rings does. When it was, well, um, when Dune was, I'm not quite finished. When Dune was, um, uh, written a bit later on. I can't remember who was the name of the guy. The guy who wrote it fought Frank in World Herbert. War II. Yeah, he he saw a lot of the romanticized imagery that fascist regimes used to um, propagate their um, uh, their regimes and to, and to uh, get this warmongering mentality going. And he really he saw a lot of that was quite similar to what Tolkien wrote. I'm not saying Tolkien was a fascist. I don't think he was. But still, at the same time, it's like that's why he wrote uh, it in such a morally ambiguous way, as did um, noticed British fantasy author Michael Moorcock, if you've heard of him. I mean, unfortunately, I've not even heard of many of these people. I know it makes me seem a bit dumb, but. Oh, don't worry, I mean, not everyone has. I mean, Michael Moorcock isn't the most famous one in the world, but I just wanted to add that one in. I mean, Star Wars is another thing we've got to mention and we haven't got round to mentioning and I'm very and, and most people are probably thinking we're well, going to mention Star Wars. So I mean, you know, I mean that's like probably the greatest we well, the biggest sci-fi franchise of all time unless you want to count Star Trek, but I don't know. Um well, yeah, well Star Wars and Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter, they're pretty much the trinity of sci-fi and fantasy. Everyone has seen the films and knows about the lore. I will sort of just briefly point out from my experience on them because I'm not as big of a fan of the franchises, but Harry Potter, I grew up near where they filmed the movies. The first three films were PG, but the others are 12A, which sort of threw me off a little bit because, you know, these are films that are aimed at kids. But as I guess because as, you know, people who grew up with the books got older and older, now they probably weren't as afraid about, oh, it's a 12A, you can't take younger kids to go see it. Well, you can, but it makes it seem like it's a bit more edgier than it actually is. Lord of the Rings, I do remember seeing uh, Fellowship of the Ring in the cinema. I don't really care much for it, really, but I, 
I'm aware of J.R.R. Tolkien's Christian roots and how it was also an animation in the 70s when a lot of animated films were not A-rated or PG that much. They, it wasn't a common rating for animation at the time. And it was from Ralph Bakshi, done Fritz the Cat. Yeah. And it was, you know, got violent at Watch places. Down, wasn't. <laughs> no, you, well, you certificate, but Lord of the Rings was a certificate, which... Um, which hmm. begs the question, what made him want to give an A if they were going to give a U to Warship Down? But that's off topic. I mean... Well, this is James <laughs> Furman we're talking about. I know that, but he gave a U rating to freaking work. Let's not get bogged down in that, okay? Um, and yes, with... uh, but the first uh, Lord of the Rings movie, Fellowship of the Ring, did get away with a PG rating for when it was initially. It's now a 12A, and it fucking should be. Um, but like, good grief! I remember watching that back in 2000, well, actually, early 2002, actually. Thinking to myself, this is the strongest PG I've ever seen. Well, maybe since Jaws, I think. And those kids, little kids who clearly didn't like it, it's like. This is only not a 12 because parents want to take their kids to sit and the BBFC just decided they had to to avoid unnecessary complaints. What a surprise. The next two films released after 12A were both rich 12A. So, yeah. Um, but I've mentioned that so many times on our podcast. It's become a moot point right now. Um, well, that's what people have said about Jurassic Park when it first came out and Lost World, which is sci-fi, but... They had a special caveat on the PG saying this film is not suitable for anyone under eight, which I always thought was a bit strange. They brought it back with that Time Machine movie that was in 2002 with Guy Pearce. I always found that a little bit strange. And, you know, Jurassic Park also had the on the PG disclaimer at the back of the deep VHS strong fantasy that you don't see the word strong violence in films unless it's 15. That always threw me off a bit. I mean, well, it that, well it is a bit unusual, yes. I mean, I'm going to... I noticed that Time Machine was also rated not only PG-13 in America, but M in Australia. Um, it's only a matter of time, if you ask me, when that, that film gets upgraded to... Uh, to what, Smith? Um, 12A, but uh, we'll wait a that time. Uh, I also wanted to bring up... I was going to bring... Yes, I was going to bring up Star Wars because we're talking about the politics of it, and um, while obviously the Empire is modelled very heavily on Nazi Germany, it is also based quite heavily on the British Empire. What of all the, um, or well, all the British people playing the impositions of British actors playing the uh, officers and everything, but it's also uh, at least when the third film came out, there's a bit of reference to the Vietnam War there with the Ewoks defeating the the Empire, being like the Viet Cong defeating the US military. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's very obvious George Lucas was a was a bit of a, le- bit of a lefty, but it's a trait I've noticed um, among these type, among um, uh, these, uh, these sort of genres. Sci-fi tends to come in with quite a left-wing bent, whereas uh, classical fantasy and epic fantasy tends to swing more to the right. I mean, I'm not saying, again, I didn't say Tog was a fascist, but he he was a bit of a devout Catholic. He was probably a Tory voter. I, I never think. Whereas one of the biggest sci-fi writers of of uh, history is, of course, H.G. Wells. And, of course, he was a renowned lefty, labourite socialist. I mean, you don't really have to, well, that's obvious if you've read any of his material, any of his uh, stuff, his bibliography. I may where um, the island Dr. Moreau and time machine that he did and wore the worlds um, from the particular passes and slowly and surely they drew their plans against us. And I know with War the Worlds, particularly the original radio program, it actually caused quite a storm when it first came out because they thought this actually is happening. It's almost like a sort of uh, war blitz type of mindset. You better I- hide. Because they're going to come. I think that's actually considered an actual misconception, or at least some people might have panicked and um, uh, might have been. Sorry, what was I going to? Might have actually panicked somewhere, and it was like overblown everything, uh, and everything. But I don't know if anyone actually uh, 
anyone actually did because of a um a lot oh uh, it's some of the law i heard about it was the orson wells version where he read it and yeah, I know, was I know. warning about the planes yeah i i i know about that i, I i'm very aware aware of that um what was i gonna say but I think it may be a miscon uh, misconception though, uh, because um, just trying to find it now on Wikipedia, which is a bit unprofessional, me. But hey ho, yeah, there was. Um, yeah, I think it's actually considered to be a bit of a uh, misconception. If you look, yeah, the War of the Worlds 1938 radio drama. Um, I'm not going to read that right now. Uh, yeah, but. You know, I mean, I think I don't know if it was. I think the reaction has been over exaggerated and embellished quite a bit. I mean, uh, look it up on anyone listening. Look it up on Wikipedia. It'll probably tell you more than I could be asked to tell you right now. But, um, but yeah, I mean, well, we'll, we'll pass world, on that for now. Yeah. It's just. A, hmm. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, I was talking about uh, uh, H.G. Wells being a lefty. War of the Worlds was his uh, outright condemnation of colonialism. The whole point is that the Martians were behaving, were treating us like the Brits treated, or many Europeans treated the people in their colo- colonial territories. So it's trying to say, hey, not so nice when it do- happens to you now, is it? Which is very progressivist for someone in the, you know, in 1896 or whenever he wrote it. And of course, time well, machines about the so uh, class divisions. Um. That's one of the great things about sci-fi, at least for those who are a bit more book ready and minded, is that it can be used as a metaphor for the world that's around us. I often will perceive sort of that world of things in a dystopian mind. So that's usually how I sort of relate to it a little bit more, which is one of the reasons why I like Purge and Civil War and movies like that went a little bit more direct, V for Vendetta and stuff. The ones that use a little bit too much metaphor can be a bit hard for me to follow. Horror op- operates on that same sort of scope as well. I mean, George Romero, Night of the Living Dead. Talk about metaphor for racism and stuff. Uh, but that's a oh, horror yeah. film, so we're not going to discuss that one. But it's, and then, ki- it's kind of sci-fi-ish. Of it's kind of sci-fi-ish. I mean, zombies have a bit of sci-fi quality to them. I mean, they say it reckon it might have happened to radiation or some shit like that. I mean, and of course, Resident Evil is a uh, zombie stuff, and that's sci-fi to to the max. No, it is. I think they're more sci-fi action films more so than anything. And probably those games. You you know a lot about Resident Evil more than I do, so I'll let you speak on that. Um, I know from what I was told that the first film actually was rated nc-17 but they had to cut out some stuff to get it to r which is a bit weird because the film was 15 just when 15 films were starting to get a bit more violent bit by bit by bit dog soldiers good example bit by bit definitely good example (laughs) well you know go figure um but i will interject um because i know when we talk about fantasy and cultural metaphors wizard of Oz. that's a movie the whole family can enjoy they re it and PG in America, but for some reason, you know, that movie scared children because of the flying monkeys and the witch of the West or the East. My mother loves that movie, so I brought it up. And it's a musical. We're going to do musicals in another week or so. And that was a metaphor for um, the uh, silver trade and uh, the bureaucrats and the barons. Uh, was that? Tycoons and that sort of thing. Was it? 1900s Fuck, America. I, I had, it was a political no satire idea. wrapped around a fantasy story about a girl who clicks her shoes and comes along with an Iron Man <laughs> and a lion. <laughs> I I didn't know any of that. No, seriously, yeah. I did not fucking know any of that. So you, you, you have to be. Yep, you you kind of an American from like the Midwest, kind of getting all on the references, you know what I mean? Now, you know, all Americans, as far as I'm concerned, actually care more about Star Wars than they care about the damn Wizard of Oz. <laughs> My grandma likes Wizard of Oz, but I like the original Star Wars movies because they weren't so woke like these Last Jedi and Rise of Skywalker they are nowadays. They got rid of Jed Carano. Which they are quite a... 
I mean, we were talking about how blatantly left wing Star Wars was, but I suppose it's not that left wing in comparison to other forms of sci fi like Star Trek, which I've never really watched, but I've heard about basically it was always very much on the progressivist bent. I mean, one of the whole things about um, uh, Star Trek is in the, this future, they've abolished money and just worked purely to better mankind. It was like, okay, yeah, that's very left wing, a very left wing position. But um, uh, also, we can get the Doctor Who, and let's face it, Doctor Who's been incredibly anti war and pro pacifism and everything. And, and so, yeah, very, very, very lefty. I mean, I don't. Like I said, I never really watched Star Trek. I watched the J.J. Abrams films. I never watched the actual TV show myself. And can I be guessing that you do watch Star Trek, Mark? I never live long and prosper. The only thing I know about Star Trek is the Uhura and Captain Kirk kiss that caused a shitstorm when it first aired because it showed, you know, a Jewish man kissing a black woman. Some people get off on that. I'm... I, I don't, but that was kind of a thing to where some stations in the, the U.S. South did not want to air it, or they'd done like some sort of tape delay. But thank you know goodness for CBS for trying to do so because they had you know Twilight Zone, and that was kind of a controversial TV series for its time. Twilight Zone was pretty much political metaphors masquerading as sci-fi, horror, and fantasy stories. And it always was a bit surreal and there would be no happy endings. And it had Rod Serling saying, now what you're about to see is a man who just feels like he has lost his way. And now he's going to be going through the Twilight Zone. And some of the yeah. episodes can be quite scary and intense. I think actually they got like 12 certificates on them. And he's had troubles and run-ins with the censors because some of the episodes dealt with, in a coded way, race, system, or... Uh, sexism and then violence obviously so yeah quite a particular one i love twilight Zone. that's one of the better shows from uh you know my mother's time she used to watch it when she was growing up um now for star wars getting back in the, on that one i didn't pick up on the politics as much i just mostly picked up on jar jar binks because he was funny and i you know Yeah, and then Darth voice Maul. Uh, Everyone was scared by Darth Maul. And it was a strong U. Now it's a PG, which is more appropriate. Well, same with the original trilogy. No, Mark? it's true. No, it's true. I mean, PG, that's certainly appropriate. I mean, the 12A, these new ones have been given, I think that's a bit excessive, really, because what six and eight year olds haven't seen star wars come on my nephews are obsessed with a damn uh, with a damn franchise what's their favorite They're characters right. is it like kylo ren or um uh, skywalker luke skywalker i or don't do know which one i don't know which one's um their favorite uh uh their favorite uh the character uh, they haven't mentioned it. All I know is that they are highly obsessed with Star Wars. They've played Star Wars Monopoly. They've said they've watched all the movies, but except for Rangers of a Sith, because my brother seems to be and his girlfriend seem to be under the impression that the film is 15, even though it's very clearly a 12A. But they haven't. Uh, but nonetheless, they still haven't uh, watched it. Well, I, I will uh, hold on a thought one. there, because um, I remember Revenge of the Sith. I saw that in cinemas, and there was like kind of a surprise and decapitation and there was a scene where i think like half of anakin skywalker's torso is dismembered i thought mm, that is a bit gruesome really so i did thought okay maybe that's why it's a 12 a but in all fairness six and eight year olds are gonna watch it anyway so i pretty much treat star wars as if it were a pg because that's what kids love um, I don't have that same sort of view with uh, like John Wick and stuff. Those are, you know, in my head, I'm sort of old school about things. Those are films that would have been an 18 back in the day. And stuff like Star Wars and Marvel would have been PG back in our day. Well, Star Wars was bloody you back in our fucking day. Yeah, exactly. Man, man. There was Seriously, some debate. 
that they were going to pass Empire Strikes Back in A, but because of the familiarity of the first one, which is A New Hope, they said, we'll keep it as you as that. Yeah, well, yeah, that, that was fair enough. I mean, if they passed Warship down as bloody you, they could probably get away of passing Star Wars as you. Obviously, it would be... I was surprised they kept for you when they re-released them in the 90s, because that would have been a... Uh, would have been PG by then to go along lot alongside things like Jurassic Park and whatnot. And yeah, the Star Wars films were in initial releases PG in America, which does make sense when you think about it. I mean, no one would expect those to be G. They even say it was, for example, a stronger PG back then. But anyway, let's get off. But, uh, but, um, um, again, I think they don't know put them at PG 13, you know, all these big budget movies, even though some of them probably don't deserve it, is because they think if it's PG, it's a kid's movie. Well, well yeah, that's, that's what not I the fault of the. That's not really the fault of the censors. That's the fault of the public, assuming that it somehow, if it's for children, then it must suck. What a dumb way to view things. I'm sorry. I know I said it before, but I'll say it again. That's dumb. It is a bit, really. I mean, let's face it. But uh, unfortunately, the PG's got on both sides of the line. has gone that way with it being allocated to Frozen rather than Jaws. And that's just the way things work. I mean, God knows it'll be... Who knows? Maybe in 30 years' time, we'll be seeing 12A-rated uh, Disney uh, Pixar flicks or PG-13-rated Disney Pixar flicks. And then we'll just see those as kids' films. And basically, again, they'd have to create some rating in between PG-13 and R and 12A and 15. But... We've discussed that earlier, and it's like, well, if this is the new one for the, uh, for the you know middle of the round family friendly flicks, and uh, anything rated R or fifteen will be the, the grown up flicks. But again, um, again, we might be getting off topic here. But I'm just trying to think what other sci fi and fantasy films uh, we could talk about. Oh, we was we did can mention we, uh, Golden Compass last time, right? Can we uh, say about PG Shape of Water? I've not seen Shape of Water. I uh, is that an M Night Shyamalan flick? That's Lady in the Water, which yeah. that was PG, but PG thirteen states style, which I, I don't I don't know much about that one. But Shape of Water is a bit of an interesting one because Guillermo del Toro a fantasy film, and that one had quite a bit of a uh, weird kinky sex stuff, um, which is fine at fifteen. Maybe they said it was promoting bestiality. And it was essentially a woman who can't speak and is a mute, uh, falling in love with some sort of fish monster thingy. And that caught a bit of a storm on right wing circles, thinking that the movie was going to endorse bestiality or something. Well, compared to Clerks 2, I would say Shape of Water is much more restrained than that. Or even yeah, compared Clerks to Splice. Takes, yeah, but Clerks 2 takes the piss out of that sort of <laughs> stuff, though. I mean, uh, so, I mean, yeah. But it's best, well, I haven't seen Shape of Water, so it probably didn't pay a piss out of it. And yeah, well, 15 R and MA15 Plus, so got the trifecta going there. Um, well, maybe well, Splice is a better with... example, because that uh, is a 15 film that I did think should have been an 18 because of how disturbing it was. It had the weird incest pedophilia, bestiality element with the, the sex thing, because it's supposed to be the uh, Adrian Brody's daughter. And then the daughter ultimately rapes the mother at the end. I'm like, Okay, that gave me a nightmare. Uh, yeah. Wait, 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 in Splice? Yeah, there's um, incestuous rape involving the mutant toward the end, and then that sex scene that people jerk off to on X videos of Adrian Brody and the mutant, There's she's not only the daughter, but she's a child, and she's not fully human. So it's a weird taboo mix of incest, pedophilia, and bestiality. I kid you not. Do you think that should be a 15 and you? I don't think so. Uh, I watched the damn film. I didn't really see, I don't think I saw quite remember the stuff. I remember it just being a typical 15 rated uh, sci-fi drama flick. I didn't see any issues, but then again, I'm quite finicky about what I think might deserve an 18. Um, well, it was think just of it like it David Cronenberg. Um, I know, done... I was going to get onto. I was going to get onto that, actually, because we're talking about sci-fi. I can't believe I mentioned David Cronenberg. I mean, and of course, uh, he's got he's got some. I don't know how many of his films I've actually seen. I've seen The Fly. 
I don't know what else I've watched of his actually. Did I? Oh, did he do Naked Lunch? He did. And Video Drum, History of Violence. Not seen that. Not Eastern seen that. Promises, The Brood, Shivers, Dead Ringers, because Jeremy Irons plays double. I have not. I have not seen that. I have not. Have I seen Brood? I don't think I've seen The Brood. Um, oh man, you are missing out. I, I, I he's do, actually I, much I, better I, than his son. I've, you know, I his son Brandon is. Even. Makes awful movies, but Video Drum is a masterpiece. It's certainly an 18 certificate as far as gore and sex is concerned. And uh, The Fly, I know it's an 18, but I thought maybe it could be fine at 15. I know it's got to be a lingering gore because the guy's leg sort of is split out with the uh, insect venom and is quite gory at the end, but it's pretty fine for 15 year olds. Yeah, I I thought the fly was pretty cool and everything. I mean, just uh, it's obviously it's not the kind of film that would obviously under firm and it's going to be an eighteen because he's a dick. Um, when probably get if most recent re rating was in two thousand five, it maintained its eighteen rating. It could probably get a fifteen nowadays. I need to rewatch the films before I get to decide that. So in right. terms of uh, Cronenberg, yes, I've watched um that film. I've watched uh, Naked Lunch recently. That was a weird flick. I didn't really think know what to think about that but i don't really give a shit no uh, i saw that movie for, too as, i, as I hated brandon, it oh. right okay well as for brandon cronenberg i saw um uh, infinity pool recently i have to admit that was quite a good film quite fucked up in some ways because of all the shit they get um they tend to show there but um pretty cool knowing that we got the complete uncut version whereas due to america's fucked up way of doing things they had to cut it down to an r rating they cut out all the cool shit so, because I, um, I talked to with this with the Canadian guy on another podcast and with uh, Joseph Ingham, and we were just left wondering, like, come on, if anything, they just could have released it on Netflix and bypassed it all together, unrated. But no, the powers that be always are in charge. Or with an NC seventeen rating, like we did with Blonde, because with Netflix, who gives a fuck? Well, I think maybe they let that one slip with Blonde because it was a marketing opportunity to capitalize it. And it was a you know sort of a big title with Anna de Armas. They probably wouldn't do that with any other film, if especially if it's like a sort of lower level, they won't advertise it as much. They'll just put it on the service and put it as unrated. Like they did with 365 Days, which is a SM drama from Poland, as far as I'm concerned. But yeah. Um, but I, know with... I mean, sorry, I was going to say, but um, I don't really think the whole big. Like I say, I think they, they said that streaming is probably a big new lease on life for the NC-17 rating. They said because it's going on streaming and not going to the cinemas and everything, they can rate it NC-17 and everything, which is, I think, very based, very cool, needs to be encouraged. And um, But then again, streaming doesn't have to be rated at all so i mean on either side of atlantic so who gives a fuck but no you actually got a good point there because um there have been some because i sometimes browse around when i was in the u.s i did see certain titles and they had them online uncut i believe killer joe uh cook the Wicked. thief his wife and her lover um last portion those were all you yeah. know Oh, man, films, I want to they it. had them on these streaming platforms and that made me very happy because I thought now they're breaking the, 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 the chain ever so That's, DVD, uh, that is Blu-ray pretty... they even still have like um, like special screenings of it that people sort of throw stuff at and laugh at showgirls like okay, that's a bit weird but there you go um, I know those aren't really sci-fi movies but Four Things is considered a sci-fi movie to some extent. Well, it is, because it's basically a Lady Lady Frankenstein, isn't it? But yes, we did mention about the censorship it received. It was worldwide. And as far as the rating is concerned, you probably thought, oh, it could have been like 15 out there. But I thought it was awfully kinky. Like, certainly one of the more sexually explicit rated R films I've seen, at least in a while, since X by Time West. Yeah, which begs the question. You know, I mean, 
you know how I stand. I expect consistency. So if it's like it's 18 here, it's like, okay, it better be R18 plus in Amer- in Australia and it better be freaking NC17 in America. And it wasn't. I mean, I know NC17 in America is a tall order, but R18 plus in Australia, I could at least expect like X was R18 plus fair. So it's like, you know, but uh, I lied. Neither here nor there. Um, well, I'm just trying to think what other uh, sci fi stuff there is. I know um, Amazon is going to do a. Uh, Something like doing uh, a series out. based on. I was going to get Fallout, yes, but I was going to say Warhammer Forty Thousand Games Workshop stuff, which um, I don't know if you were a collector of that growing up. I collected a bit of it. I know a bit of a lore. Fucking looking forward I... to it. Henry Cavill's and. I am not that much of a nerd. I never played Magic the Gathering or Pokemon or Beyblade. I right, wouldn't know what to War... tell you, but you can go Games on. Games Workshop. It. Games Workshop was way cooler than all that stuff, but uh, I knew you wouldn't be cool enough to be into that sort of stuff, Mark, so don't worry. It's all right. I, I wouldn't expect that much from you. Joke, by the way, dude, don't worry. Um, um, but no, that's coming up. That's going to be coming. It, pro- it should better be like 15 slash R rating or fuck it, even 18 slash NC17 rating. Nah, actually, the fantasy thing would keep it into the lower ratings. So I'm looking forward to that. I mean, Fallout came out. That was awesome. And yeah, it's 15 rated, even though the video games were 18 rated. But then again, video games seem to get rated a bit harsher. And fuck me, that was awesome. It was so funny. People complain about how woke and lefty uh, Fallout was. It's like, have you not played the fucking game? It's a complete send up of, of war mongering, na- ultra nationalism and corporatism. If you haven't seen that, it, don't have to look closely. It's slammed right into your face from the get-go. Well, uh, that's what people said about Rage Against the Machine, as far as band are concerned. You know, people say they like killing in the name of, but they didn't realize it was you know promoting anti-capitalist awareness. You got people like Paul Ryan, against- who was a senator, who said, "Oh look, you," and he told them right back, "Well, don't do you get where we're coming from?" They called Rage Against the Machine. What the fuck do you think they're on about? Yeah, they ain't talking about, like, you know, we don't, they don't support Republicans. They probably don't even support most Democrats. Like, they don't. They're sort they of already made quite clear. Exactly. Other than, you know. other than lots of Bernie. But uh, again, God that's going to Tom Morello. Yeah. Although, um, yeah, I was going to say, probably get political. But sci-fi is quite political in nature, and fantasy can could be quite political in nature, and Fuji for other reasons. I mean, we got uh, C.S. Lewis's... Um, stuff and everything which is not only just complete christo fascist blabbering but also a lot of people have, have accused him of being quite racist and that's not just a bunch of quote unquote pc college students um philip pullman who wrote the his dark materials trilogy and is one of my and is one of the most coolest authors ever uh has called him out on that and he's also a big vocal supporter of trans rights so yeah he's automatically better than jk rowling well, I'll, I won't comment on that one, mainly because the Harry Potter movies and me being a 90s millennial, I already have my certain opinions on Harry Potter and stuff. But it does remind me of another author whose name is Orson Scott Card, who got into a bit of flack when they'd done a film adaptation of Ender's Game. I don't know the books or anything like that, but I know people protested it because they thought... Why is he promoting this homophobic message? The fact that there was some characters that were called the buggers. Yes, bugger can also be code for sodomy or code for um, a man who does anal rape to another man. It was supposed to be a sort of metaphor for the homosexual lobby or something like that. And they, they, Lionsgate told them, change the name, but it's the damage was already done. Well, I mean, sometimes... If a genie's out of bottle, you can't really always put it back in. I mean, what can you, what well, can you but, do? Um, I'm just trying to think what other sci-fi so there is. Well, well so again, sci-fi and fantasy is such a, again very broad tent, very broad umbrella. We could be here all day if we keep if we want to talk about every single thing that could be described as sci-fi or fantasy on this uh, on this podcast. I mean, how how even how it might re- might relate to BBFC or MPAA ratings. I mean, let's face it, superhero movies could be described as sci-fi or fantasy, depending on which ones we use. Um, obviously, and if most of our sci-fi, like Superman, Spider-Man, Incredible Hulk, most of it, well, 
even Iron Man because he's just technology. Well, like Batman has got a bit of sci-fi elements to him, but of course he's got ones like Shazam or Wonder Woman, which are more fantasy because they've got more magical elements to them. Uh, oh, and and Thor and Doctor Strange and all that, all that bollocks. Although Thor kind of in the films tried to make it more sci-fi by saying it's not magic; it's just cutting-edge technology, which is uh, which makes me think of Blade. Also, because that's not fantasy vampire, that's um, sci-fi vampire, in that it's a virus that causes the vampirism. Uh-huh. That makes sense. Oh, I'm rambling a bit here. Right. Uh, but, uh, you yeah, know, we could have mentioned all the Thor superhero stuff and Endgame. I know that was, you know, it was a 12 a but it was a bit more of a higher end because the decapitation of Thanos. And then uh, I think there was some heavy sword fighting Thanos, involving Hawkeye. Thanos and, was... Dude, Thanos wasn't decapitated. Thanos' death was quite... Uh, Endgame is very central. Most Marvel films are very central, 12A and PG-13. The two that have really pushed both those two ratings are, of course, last year's Guardians of the Galaxy, and more egregiously, the previous year's Doctor Strange and Multiverse of Madness, which, oh my god, I when I watched that, I was like, I was like fair play, BBFC. You've actually really done, really showed yourself to be quite cool by passing this 12A. Usually, I thought, you know, you think to yourself, oh, they're such get your pants, scaredy cat girlies for automatically write, rating horror films 15. It's like, this is a 12A. Very based of you. I'm very impressed. You, you've, uh, you know, gold star, thumbs up, big tick, A. plus. You uh, proved yourself to have some bollocks, some backbone. I'm guessing you but haven't I've seen, mentioned... um, uh, well, outside of Da Vinci Code and Casino Royale, I'm guessing you haven't seen. Ten Cloverfield Lane. No, no, or I have. Red I have. Eye. No, I have. I have. I have. I watched Red Eye quite recently again, actually. And um, that movie was first disturbing. Things, first things for first things first. It's a lot better than Flight Plan, which came out the same year, and has a say and is and is also a thriller based on a plane. So there's that. But uh, no, I mean it, it is quite. It does quite cool to show what they will, will pass 12A when push comes to shove. But they need to. Be a bit more consistent with that and stop putting all these 15s on these, frankly, on these PG 13 rated films because it's not making them look good. It's not making us Brits look good. Uh, Penn and Cloverfield Lane was quite was quite a base the decision of theirs. I give them the thumbs up. Uh, if only they could keep that momentum up, but they're not, and Boo sucked to them for it. Well, the only horse films me, really. I can think of that probably are fine at 12. Well, Krampus should have been a 12, but um, Eight-Legged Freaks was fine. I know some people really can't watch that, like you. Um, oh, warm I can watch bodies it, but it does, and dark it does give me the shits. I can watch it, it just gives me the shits, so that's all. <laughs> um, but another one I wanted to bring up sci-fi-wise is, because I keep hearing this through forums, because everyone says, you should have been 18, bro. Upgrade. I don't know if you've ever heard or seen of it, but it's like no, Venom. See, seen up, seen upgrade. Yes, I've seen uh, upgrade, dude. Yeah, it's very much like Venom. Yep, it's the only proper R-rated one. Remind me a bit like RoboCop in the sense of a man losing his uh, humanity to a machine. Yes, uh, I've seen it. I liked it. I thought it was brilliant. Perfect R. Because I hated that slash- movie for some reason, <laughs> but I've. The people that yes. everyone brings it up because some people were really f- some some people were really freaked out doing the scene where a blade comes through a mi- man's mouth and gives him like a sort of Glaswegian smile. It's like, and he's doing a fight inside a, a bedroom, and that scene to some extent reminded me of the brutality of Hans Labyrinth, which is a fantasy film completely in Spanish. It is certainly one of the most violent 15 films ever made, as far as like the justified sheer brutality his- of it. But it's justified by 15? historical, yes, yeah, justified by historical context. No, but you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, people really didn't like the scene with the man's face being smashed with a fucking wine bottle, and the torture stuff. I've only seen stuff. it once. Uh, that movie is actually more scary than most horror films are because of the political content, which. You know, power to Del Toro for making a movie that makes Franco look like the mini Hitler that he was. And I hope Hungary doesn't turn out that way, but it will. Sorry, yeah. I'm ranting on. 
But if you have any last thoughts, you're more than welcome to do so. I probably will pack this in. So it looks like we've done this one quite long. Oh, we'll say this has gone on a bit. Oh, yeah, we usually we have a 90 minute one. We've gone on to like 105 minute, minutes now. So um, I don't really have much to add, really. really. I mean, we've kind of kind of rambled and been a bit over place this uh this podcast but um uh it's okay it's okay because sci-fi and fantasy are pretty broad category that's what so I was there saying, wasn't yeah. really much of an option but, uh and nonetheless thank you for stopping on by if you have any last questions just let me know otherwise um for the audience out there we'll probably see you again for uh musicals or the PG certificate or um, political thrillers. Whatever idea comes up that I think will stick, we'll let you know. Until then. Yeah. All right. Then, I'm, uh, yeah, have a good day, everyone, and uh, yeah, enjoy your weekend. Well, well, actually, whenever you're just, well, stay safe and have a good time. All right. The same for everyone. Ciao.